Hello again. Um, it's very nice to be here with you today. Um, I am very excited to tell you about a beautiful, fun story and one of the most exciting projects that I had ever worked on in my entire um, short career. Um, it has to do with uh, the pandemic and as a uh, as an engineer who does computational fluid dynamics, um, uh, I was I always wondered if um, uh, if I can uh, how I can apply uh, my knowledge in computational fluid dynamics, etc., to something that relates to public health. And the circumstances were amazing that made that happen. So this is going to be a story about how that happened, as much as it is about the science and the engineering techniques that we developed. First, I would like to thank the entire team and um, those who supported us. So definitely the Salt Lake County. Um, let me uh, reorient myself here with the camera. Um, Salt Lake County, the Utah Symphony, Utah Opera, Center for High Performance Computing in our department, definitely. And my team, my co-PI, Professor Sutherland, uh, who many of you um, know, um, Dr. Josh McConnell, um, a former postdoc in our team, your own, your one and only Hayden Hadworth, um, uh, whom I was really lucky to have on my team. Uh, he led the effort here along with Mokbel Karam, my other PhD student, um, to make this a reality. Uh, so early on in the pandemic, we were all hanging out at home and uh, trying to teach our classes, uh, trying to handle the craziness with the kids um, uh, uh, running the asylum, essentially. Um, and uh, one day I was sitting outside um, and uh, working on a lecture and I get this this email from uh, former president Dave Pershing, who is a faculty in our department, um, text specifically on June 23rd at 10, 10 a.m. And uh, he emails me and uh, Professor Sutherland asking if we can help um, the Utah Symphony somehow model their aerosol uh, uh, transmission um, uh, at the or uh, at at one of their venues, specifically at Ravenel Hall. Um, you're probably familiar with that. It's down in downtown Salt Lake City. So what they were worried about are wind instruments. So while you can mask string instruments and the piano and the and the percussions, it is impractical to mask um, the flute, um, uh, the bassoon, the trombone, the trumpet, etc. It has been attempted, but it affects the acoustics in a really bad way. And so they'd really want um, for those players to play without um, masking the instruments. But at the same time, if you've ever played a wind instrument, you know that those are aerosol manufacturing machines. And as far as we know, these um, respiratory diseases, they are primarily transmitted via the route of expiratory droplets. So you're playing into your wind instruments and all those expiratory droplets are accumulating. They're being aerosolized and being emitted into the stage. And they were worried about uh, potential contamination over there. I mean, albeit with testing and all of that, there might be a potential risk of infection. So they want to understand what's going on here. But to put things in context, um, so they reached out to us by end of June and they wanted results by the first week of September. Um, and as grad students, I know you know what that means when your advisor comes in and they're like, okay, I want this next week. And you have like a thousand things to do and your work, you got to work nonstop, be very effective and efficient in your work. So we pretty much had about 10 weeks um, to get this done. It's like the story of my life. Um, um, poor Hayden and Mokbel, um, they they really did like uh, the best effort, effort here. So um, anyway, to put things in context, uh, just to give you an idea of how much effort and work this had taken, each calculation, each simulation that we did um, consisted of 15 million grid points. That's a lot of grid points, okay, if you do CFD. Took about five days to finish. Each simulation took about five days to finish, and that's running on about 10,000, uh, on about 1,000 to 1,400 um, uh, cores, so on a supercomputer. Um, data analysis was a nightmare. Um, so you do the CFD and then just dealing with the data and moving the data across the network. Um, that was a nightmare. It took us about three days just to sometimes to calculate an average. A time average would take about um, uh, eight hours just to calculate um, one-time average. So these are really heavy duty data sets. And um, as I said, it took about one day to do a single time average. Um, and we're like, okay, were we out of our minds? And in retrospect, I'm so glad that we were. So um, James and I sat together after we saw the email um, 
of course, um, remotely. We sat together because no one was was able to see anyone. Um, and we said, okay, how can we model this? How can we bring this COVID-19 transmission problem into the realm of scientific computing, computational fluid dynamics? Well, the simple realization that a virus attaches to a um, expiratory or respiratory droplet, and as that droplet, um, some droplets are large enough, they you know, fly off and deposit. And that's the six foot um, distancing um, rule. You know, it's only effective for large droplets, but the smaller droplets, those that are that break up by definition, that get aerosolized and they move with the air wherever the air is going. And then it hit us. It's pretty simple. All we need is a tracer of these aerosols or respiratory droplets. And we assume that each droplet has a virus stacked on, on it and see what is the worst case scenario. And so once you once you um, uh, recognize that, you focus on the respiratory droplets. Wind instrument emissions can then be modeled as simply as a scalar tracer. So it's just this advection equation. Couldn't be any simpler, really. Um, and then if you capture the airflow plus the tracer, tracer, then we can track the virus. This is an example of what I mean by that. So um, this a little incense stick just is an illustration. I did this for um, the Utah Symphony team to tell them what we plan on doing. And you put a fan that mimics the airflow and it pushes um, the tracer around. Um, some of the limitations up front, I want to tell you about the limitations of our study, and then we can um, focus on the results. Um, we are not providing any recommendations on whether to resume activities or not. Um, rather, we are providing insight into the fate of instrument emissions um, to inform risk mitigation. So the idea is where there's going to be a high accumulation of expiratory droplets, there's more likely a higher risk of infection if those droplets are infected with the virus. And so once we figure out the um, concentration profiles, then we can potentially figure out the um, risk calculation. We're not epidemiologists, so the epi people could do this. And generally in, this, in the scope we're, we're looking at in terms of um, concentration profiles, we can apply a dose response model. And in the regime we're at, it's, it's a linear mapping. So um, high concentrations correspond very directly to higher infection risk and vice versa. Okay, droplet aerosol distributions were not considered. Um, we just assume just the smallest droplets that these are essentially just move with the flow, wherever the flow is going for a worst case scenario. Um, detailed emissions from individual instruments were, were not available. Um, all we did was um, uh, we looked at this study over here where they looked at instrument emissions clearly depending on the pitch and um, the note you're playing and the tone, the volume flow rate from your mouth, you're gonna get different particle emissions. We picked, took the worst case scenario, took the peak concentrations and used those. Again, we're targeting the worst case scenario. If we can mitigate the worst case scenario, then the best case scenario is gonna be so much better, okay? Um, for those who know a little bit more about CFD, we used filtered large eddy simulation with the dynamics Magarinsky model, first, second order um, uh, Ranga Kata um, scheme. So either forward Euler or second order um, RK2, we are fully explicit because all the time scales are kind of similar in this problem. And in space, we use the second order uh, TVD scheme, total variation diminishing. So, you know, all things for the CFD minded. Our resolution was about five centimeters um, in each direction and time step size is ranged between um, 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 4 seconds. In terms of physics, we didn't consider any evaporation, any deposition, as we said. Um, again, and the instrument emissions were modeled um, just as a tracer. We added a source term to each scalar transport equation, and um, uh, that's how we did it. Now, some instruments were under-resolved because, um, so what we mean by under-resolved is that um, the area of the uh, instrument exit um, or exhaust is smaller than the grid point. So what we did, we, we looked at either matching the velocity or matching the flow rate. Um, and so we ended up matching the flow rates um, based on the true instrument. Um, and it, we found out that this has an effect locally. But um, with the bulk of the airflow, that was our hypothesis, and we verified that, is that it doesn't matter um, much of what's happening locally if these aerosols are going to be transported by the large um, bulk um, scale motion of the air. Okay, let's talk about Abravanel Hall. It was named after Maurice Abravanel, who emigrated, whose parents emigrated to Salt Lake City um, in the early um, start of the century. And... Um, 
uh, he was a conductor and they built the Abravanel Hall, I think, in, in, um, in the 80s, 1980s, and they named it after him. He was the first conductor of the Utah Symphony. Um, uh, you can read up about him on Wikipedia. Um, the, uh, now, I told you we had 10 weeks to do the project, but we lost about four weeks or three weeks um, for it because... Um, for any CFD calculation, what matters are the thing, the most important thing you need to know are boundary conditions. So in this case, we need to know where the air is coming from. In this case, we knew that the air was coming on from these um, vents up there. And we need to know where the return vents are. So we had the return vents over here in the back. I'll show you a diagram in a minute. Um, so, uh, you know, the Utah County decided to hire a company, an HVAC company, to go and do the measurements. We were on phone calls with them, telling them what we need, what we expect. So they went and, you know, brought an entire team and they did all measurements and they sent us a spreadsheet, essentially saying that the average velocity in the in the hallway was zero. And we're like, what? They said, yeah, it's zero. And like, well, you're HVAC people. How could this be zero? Well, it's a very low flow, so it's approximately zero. But this doesn't make sense. You need, you know, to use higher sensitivity instruments. They're like, no, no, it's the turbulence. And we're like, yeah, okay. We rolled up our eyes, rolled up our sleeves, and went down ourselves. We got, I actually have um, some of those um, devices here. We got a few anemometers, and we went down and did the measurements ourselves. You can see our team hanging out here. There's uh, Mokbel in his... Uh, uh, blue shirt over here and um, Hayden is hidden. So I actually Hayden that's Hayden. That's where Hayden is um, Your own Hayden. He was the uh, Only guy on the team who had the guts to go up on that um, on that thing um, These are the air vents. So we wanted to take measurements of um, all the inlet vents where the air is coming from um, There was a door over here. So that door is going to be really important and whoops and another door on the other side um, my clicker is a little bit weird today. Um, and some return vents in the back over here, if you can see some of the return vents, and that's James standing over there. Um, this is These are some more pictures of the team. That's me, mask and a shield. And um, that's Hayden sitting in the bucket over here, and Mokbel and Josh were um, uh, listening in to the measurements collected by Hayden to t do some averages and some stats on the measurements were taken. Um, this is Hayden up there doing measurements um, as well. This is a view, a peek of what's behind the inlet vent. So if you see there are um, some main lines with the AC coming in, okay, these are the main lines over here, and then um, they um, uh, uh, route out into the actual vents where the air is coming in. The vents were not continuous across the, um, the stage, so we had gaps in between them, and we captured that, that accurately. Now, the Utah Symphony gave us um, an original, we call that the original arrangement, which is the seating. Um, they're supposed six foot socially distanced um, seating. We knew that those six feet are not gonna matter um, when there's airflow involved. Um, the idea is like, you know, if you, if you sneeze and there's a fan um, um, upwind of you and, you know, you can infect a person that's 20 feet away, right? And so we knew that um, was going to happen, and we knew the seating of the um, instrumentalists is going to be a big deal. And this is the original seating where they had kind of the wind instruments dispersed in the middle, and we knew from the get-go that this is a bad idea, um, having all the wind instruments scattered in the middle, and all the string instruments shown here in kind of gray scale, and uh, timpani, the bass, the, um, the pianist over here, the harp, those all can be mass but all the colored dots um, are actually wind instruments so this is called this is what we call the um, um, original arrangement and I'll show you another um, map of that um, we were able to collect concentration and volumetric flow rates from that study that I mentioned earlier um, now what I want to show you is um, the uh, same arrangement but on a different scale so what you're looking at here are two dimensions there's the color dimension and there's the size dimension you see different instruments have different colors and different sizes. The colors correspond to the jet speed of the emission at the exit of the instrument. Um, the more red you are, the higher the speed of the jet at the exit. The more blue you are, the lower the speed of the instrument. So for example, the oboe is one of the lowest instruments. French horn is one of the lowest jet instruments. The trumpet um, and the clarinet, the flute, the bassoon, 
They are high jet instruments. We call those, we made up the name, we call them super um, spreaders because they can potentially spread a infected droplet as far away as possible. Now, the other dimension is size. And um, the larger the size, the larger the number of particles an instrument is emitting. And the smaller the size, the smaller the number of particles an instrument is emitting. So if you look at the flute, it's a very small size. So it means it's emitting little, in, little number of droplets compared to the trumpet. You know, the trombone is somewhere in the middle. But you can see the combination. For example, the flute is a super spreader, but a low, em but a low emitter. However, the trumpet is both a super spreader and a super emitter. So that's the other word we use. The super emitter is an instrument that emits a lot of droplets that could be potentially infected, infected, okay, and infect others. Worst combination is being essentially a trumpet, super spreader, and super emitter. Okay, this is going to be very helpful as we develop our mitigation strategy. All right, all right. So let's show you now the baseline flow field and emission characterization of what happens um, in a Bravenol hole untouched. What you're looking at here is our sim a, a simulation of um, the Bravenol hole. You see the air vents at the top. Um, the, what I'm going to show here are the colors of speed or um, uh, the velocity on a log scale. Okay, and minimum of 0 0.1 meter per second to 0 0.5 meter per second. Um, so red is high, um, uh, white is uh, uh, is uh, uh, minimum, and uh, sorry, blue is minimum, and white is somewhere in the middle. Okay, um, these are transient calculations of what's going on. I'm going to let this run through as you absorb the animation here. Um, the instruments, uh, instrumentalists were modeled at the, as these cylinders, not that it was going to matter much. Um, and most of them are seated, actually. And so, um, you know, and we tried to capture all of the instruments. Now, what you observe here, if you're a fluid mechanics person or a CFD person, you kind of want to get an idea of what's happening in the flow. You notice that there are two large structures that dominate um, uh, the, uh, the hole. First, there's very good mixing in the hallway. Uh, in the in the hall, and I'm surprised at given how old the venue is, um, it was pleasantly comfortable. I mean, some new buildings we 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 build now, you can't get the air conditioning right. Um, over there, it was just like perfect. You sit there, you're very comfortable. You know, there's no temperature gradients. You don't hear any fan running. Um, but you observe two structures. There's a large structure um, um, working itself, kind of in the back. Okay, you notice that in the back, and I'll show you some streamlines later. Um, and there's another um, large structure, um, we call that the frontal co cortex, <laughs> vortex, um, uh, working out front, okay? Those are gonna be important as we understand um, how the aerosols are being uh, moved around. Now you notice in the back here, um, there's a return vent, okay? You see a return vent, and you see another return vent over there, and so on and so forth, okay? This is another view, and a front view, if you're looking into the hall, into the stage, um, you see um, what the airflow looks like, okay? And like I said, the two large structures are those two guys. Um, there's kind of the frontal vortex and kind of two counter-rotating vortices in the back. And in the middle, it's uh, fairly kind of quiescent, okay? But that's going to be important. Now, think of this, um, a, a the oboe or the flute sitting up here, and there are you know, emitting or the trumpet sitting back there and they're both a super emitter and a super spreader, um, they can potentially just infect everyone. And if the um, recirculation, um, excuse me, does not um, uh, exit or does not break, um, they're going to infect everyone, right? Because the accumulation is going to keep accumulating. All right. So now let's see um, the concentration profiles. Like I said, we're going to trace, we're going to model or emissions as a tracer. So these instruments are continuously emitting, and we're going to color the scale, the scalar um, on a scale, um, on a log scale as well. Um, we're going to do 0 0.1 um, particles per particle per liter, one particle per liter, and 10 particles per liter. And the colors go from um, yellow, orange to kind of reddish. And I'll let this um, run. I'll move to the side, and you can see it. Uh, so you can see there's this initial transient, and then um, the closer to the instrument you are, the more red you are. It means you're emitting, um, you have kind of high uh, part number of particles per volume. And then as you dilute, right, you're kind of spreading these particles, you change color from 
uh, red to, um, uh, to orange to yellow as you move up. But when we saw this, um, uh, we said, yeah, there's no way this is going to work. Now, we assume the worst case scenario that all of those wind instruments are playing at the same time, which might not be realistic or might be realistic for a fraction of um, a, uh, a certain um, uh, symphony or piece. Um, however, you know, you know, trying to capture that specific, those specifics are not, is not reasonable, um, especially given the time frame that we have. Okay, so how do we make more quantitative sense out of this? What we did, we took a plane, um, what we call that the breathing zone area, um, uh, because we realized that, you know, where I'm standing, what matters to me is the air, the region of the air that I'm breathing. I don't care if there's a virus floating 20 feet ahead of me, ab above me. I don't care as long as it doesn't make it into my breathing zone. So we defined the breathing zone from um, 0 0.90 cent 90 centimeters, 0.9 meters to about 1.3 uh, met uh, meters. So those, um, the players are seated, right? So it goes from uh, just kind of mid chest to slightly above uh, um, uh, their head. And we took a spatial average and then a time average spatial average vertically and a time average across that entire plane and what we got is this and again i'm showing um concentrations particles per liter red is 100 particles per liter and blue is 0 0.1 and white is somewhere in the middle and you can see this is really really bad and we said from the get-go that the trumpets are are going to be the worst um, offenders in this case because they're both super spreaders and super emitters. And you see how they essentially barrage. There's a barrage of particles going um, to the um, to the percussions and the trombone. Um, you notice that the trombone there. Um, although they were um, slightly super emitters, but they are close to return vents, so all their emissions just kind of go in. But you see here the flute um, and the flautist. So as if you're playing the flute, you have two emissions, right, from the from the close to the reed and from the exit. So that's kind of the flute and the flautist. You see um, two spots um, coming out over here. And then there's the oboe. There's a barrage also affecting the um, the string instrument. So this was that we didn't like this, and we asked ourselves. Okay, what do we do now? Um, well, we realized in retrospect um, what we call the car smoker analogy. Now, suppose that for some reason um, you must transport an individual who is smoking a cigarette in your car. I don't know. I grew up where everyone um, uh, was smoking, you know, so you couldn't get away from smoke or having someone um, in your car who is smoking. So, what would you do? Um, what would you do? to minimize exposure to the smoke, okay? You would open up the windows, right? Blast the AC open, keep the car moving. Why? Because you wanna bring in fresh air to replace the infected air or the smoke, right? And you would probably ask the smoker to sit back as far away from you as possible and close to the window. Why? Because you also want all of that smoke to kind of just leave, right? To go out of the window. So this is exactly what we did. The analogy here is by opening the window, blasting the AC and keeping the car moving, um, this is the equivalent of modifying the ventilation at a Bravenel hole. So essentially we would throttle the return, change the um, uh, change the return to from 100% to 80% maybe, and then open a couple of doors, see what, what we, if there are windows that we can open on the hall, in the hall to add more return vents um, to, the, uh, to the venue. And we would ask, the sm asking the smoker to sit close to a window would be the equivalent of moving the instruments, uh, instrumentalists around and placing them potentially closer to return vents. Like that was cra a crazy idea to propose. You're taking an orchestral arrangement that's been centuries in the making. I mean, the rules for seating orchestra, I don't know, they are Hayden probably knows more. It was good that we had Hayden on board with us um, because he's a classical music connoisseur. Um, and so modifying an orchestral arrangement based on CFD, that was like really, really cool. And we were so excited to see what we could do. And we started, you know, telling everyone um, this was, uh, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, as we tried to explain what we were doing, we told everyone that if you change the airflow, you change where the aerosols go. So this was our mantra. And so the next steps were focused on looking at different seating arrangement variations. How did we do this? 
it was essentially trial and error and some knowledge of knowing. Um, remember that map with the super spreaders, super emitters, we kind of tried to place them um, um, arbitrarily. So we, we ran about five seating arrangements and three HVAC variations. We closed doors, open doors, 80%, open doors and 60%. In total, we had run about 20 full scale simulations um, with more than 500,000 CPU hours. Now, what that means, a CPU hour is the equivalent of essentially one computer crunching numbers continuously for one hour. Okay, so imagine if you had 500,000 CPUs and you ran them for one hour, that's 500,000 CPU hours. Or if you had, you know, 50 CPUs and however long you run that, so you get, so that's the equivalent. If you had one computer, that would be equivalent for um, uh, of that computer running for about 57 years just crunching um, those, um, all of those um, calculations, okay? Um, what I'm gonna show you here are just the relevant cases. I don't wanna bore you with all the details and all the arguments and uh, you know discussions we had together. Um, I'm gonna show uh, two relevant cases. The first one was the original seating arrangement because we didn't want to affect the orchestra as much as we can wanted to avoid that. But we said, okay, let's open the doors and see what happens. So when you open the doors, if you notice here, there's um, that door. Um, to stage right or stage left, whatever they call it. And then there's the other door over here. So effectively what those doors did, they gave us an additional um, uh, return vents. And so let's see what happens. Um, and you can tell qualitatively immediately that, you know, while they had an impact um, and you notice the simulation didn't run very long because we immediately knew it wasn't gonna be as effective as we uh, mitigation that we wanted to. But you notice that it does affect the instruments close by, but the extent, the reach of that door was not um, very strong enough. And you can see this from these streamlines. The purple streamlines, they show you, um, they show you where um, the extent of the door is. That's it. So it doesn't really get um, far in um, as, as much as we would like to. Um, now, I want you to focus on um, these regions. These regions, um, they, they look like eyes and eyebrows, um, but those regions are effectively where we have access to return vents to um, get the air, kick the potentially infected air out. And so the next step, we said, okay, we're going to take this, this um, situation with the open doors because the open doors gave us huge return vents. So you could, we could put two, three instruments close to those doors. And let's go ahead and modify the seating arrangement. Okay, so we're going to do this together right now. Now, we, this is in retrospect. Remember, when we did this, we were like just randomly trying things with as, as much judgment as we could tell, but visualization was critical. So um, here's the original arrangement drawn to the scale that I introduced earlier. Color is again, higher color means um, super spreader, so higher jet speed and the larger the size means larger number of particles that the instrument is emitting. And I'm gonna superimpose this on top of um, that color map, um, those streamlines and the eyebrows and the eyes that I've shown earlier. And I'm gonna move um, all the, um, uh, uh, percussion instruments to the side and let's see how we can start arranging this so first of all i'm really worried about the trumpets okay and we know there are um two big uh, two uh, a lot of return vents over here there's probably three in each one of those eyebrows so we decided to move the trumpets to the side keep them next to the trombone now we tried as much as possible um to keep instrument uh, groups together Except for the trumpet, we kept all of the instrument uh, groups together, but the poor trumpets, we put them in the corners. But that's good because we want to get, they are both a super spreader and super emitter. All right, so we put the clarinets in the back. Next, we move the flutes to the, um, to the side. The French horns, we put them here. Remember, the French horns were um, uh, not super spreaders, so they were not emitting their um, instruments as far, uh, their emissions as far as possible. And then we put the oboes in the back, the tuba over there. We rearranged the bassoon, and then we brought in the um, uh, percussions again. And lo and behold, using computational fluid dynamics, we created a new orchestral seating arrangement that for a Bravenel hall that works really well, as we will see, to reduce um, potential accumulation of uh, aerosols and therefore uh, reduce infection. So I'm going to show you next the simulation. I'm going to step away and let you be the judge uh, qualitatively of what you see. Okay.
this is amazing. When we saw the results of the simulation, we were like, whoa, you know, we went from pretty much a dust cloud into almost nothing. Are there emissions here? Absolutely. They're going to continue emitting, but those emissions they have, they're leaving as the minute, the second they come out, they're going to go out. And these doors, um, the building is really pressurized. So the air speeds are pretty high. I don't, I don't recall the, uh, the numbers. Hayden might, might remind me after in the, in the Q&A, but those speeds were very high. So you could see as they're like sucking out a lot of air. And this was really good. So quantitatively, we went from this to that. And that's an arrangement that I feel comfortable standing, um, standing in, uh, even unmasked. Um, that's how far I was willing to um, uh, do the litmus test, okay? Um, in terms, again, of more quantitative numbering, this curves, uh, these curves, they show um, the percentage volume occupied by concentration. The red curve is the initial arrangement with the closed doors, and the blue curve is our, um, uh, our modified arrangement with the, with the open doors. Now, this is a cumulative function. So on the x-axis, what you're seeing is uh, log 10 of the concentration. So this is 10 to the minus 3 particle per liter, 10 to the minus 2, et cetera, 1 particle per liter, 10 particles per liter, 100 particles per liter. You see that the red curve, the original arrangement, most of the volume was occupied by concentrations from um, 0.1 to about 1 particle per liter. In our new arrangement, we move that occupancy uh, to mostly, you know, 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 3 particles per liter. And that's where we came up with the uh, about order of a 10 to 100 reduction in emissions in the breathing zone. Okay. Um, skin in the game is the litmus test. Um, there's this um, Lebanese-American contrarian philosopher, um, Nicholas Nassim Talib, if you haven't heard of him. Um, he wrote The Black Swan. Um, he's into... Um, uh, you know, crazy events and uncertainty and things like if you if you like the math and philosophy of um, risk assessment uncertainty, uh, read his books. A lot of fun. He has this concept called skin in the game, which is essentially the litmus test. You know, walk the walk, talk the talk, etc. Um, we were willing to go. This is the our litmus test, skin in the game. We went there to the orchestra. We attended and we subsequently went up on the stage and met all the players and. When we, we came in there, we were invited after they, they opened up. It was the best feeling ever to see that they had their doors open. Okay, In terms of free arrangement, um, they considered that and they we haven't seen if they implemented it exactly, but I know they adopted some variations of the arrangement. They reduced the size of the orchestra, but they moved some instruments around. Um, I don't want to keep this long, so it's all, almost um, um, 35 minutes. Um, you know, I, I like to talk a lot. I could spend two hours talking about this, but, you know, I know you have other important things to do, so I'll try to wrap it up um, in the next five minutes. Um, it, our conclusion is that, look, any analysis that does not consider airflow dynamics um, into disease, airborne disease transmission, is going to be lacking. By definition, these are airborne diseases. There's the word air in there. If you cannot understand what the air is doing, then your, your risk assessment or your prediction, your rules of thumb are not going to be very effective. Okay. And we, when, we found that there's a big um, gap between epi and people in the sciences and engineers and those who do fluid mechanics. Um, um, I actually had an interaction with someone who said, who told me that um, uh, we were looking at doing a study for uh, their venue. And uh, they said, if, there, if you don't have an epidemiologist on your team, then I do not trust your work. And I told him, uh, actually, if you don't have a fluid, fluid dynamics person on your team, I will not trust your analysis. And so then we brought in the epi people and they were amazed. They said, you know, the epi people essentially said, this is this, you know, we're going to focus on the virology. We're going to focus on the viral load, et cetera. But the air moving, transporting that viral load, that's what, that's the mechanism of transmission. So it was very important to bring in those two worlds together. CFD is essentially invaluable. In this case, that's the best tool that we have to do these airflow analysis. It's going to be very specific to each venue because boundary conditions are different, airflow conditions are going to be different, etc. Um, 
rules of thumb, we had just a couple of rules of thumb. Um, it's hard to draw general conclusions like the six foot social distancing thing. However, um, our rules of thumb are to encourage air replacement as much as possible um, and seat super spreaders and super emitters close to return vents. Okay, and next time, you know, you're standing in a meeting, maybe stand close to a door or maybe go close to a return vent. You know, that's going to be air replacement is going to be a very effective strategy um, when, you know, you don't have a lot of information, whether the people are immune or not, whether they are sick or not. You know, it's it's hard to to gauge all of that. So air replacement is a strategy that no one is going to argue with. Um, and in fact, it's quite creative and um, fun to to work with. Okay, um, I have a bunch of things over here. The the one thing that I would dream of is that um, this arrangement, the seating arrangement, we used expertise and our judgment. Would be great if we had a machine learning model that would run through those si simulations and come up with a um, best seating arrangement. This could be applied to um, orchestras, to um, you know school buses, um, daycares, and so on and so forth. Clinics, you know, um, emergency rooms, etc. And we definitely need low cost CFD models and faster, faster turn around um, time scenario analysis. That's what my group is working on um, right now with ultra fast, ultra fast response um, CFD to get these calculations done in a matter of seconds rather than days. Um, uh, I am going to give you just a slight perspective of um, what we found in the literature. Clearly, this was all new to us. We had never done anything like this, anything with public health. Um, and so when we scanned the literature, uh, we were able to summarize our findings as follows. If you look at model, if you plot model, plot model complexity versus um, the simulation volume, so the size of the simulation, um, um, if a model complexity, you know, the simplest models you could do are essentially like potential flow model. Excuse me. Um, mass conservation and scalars, you don't worry about the dynamics at all. And then you do maybe RANS, Reynolds averaging, cross-scale transport, maybe RANS with Lagrangian, maybe large eddy simulation scalar, large eddy simulation Lagrangian, all the way to DNS. And then you try to find the studies um, of how these models correspond with um, simulation volume, starting from a cookie box. You know, we typically, when we do DNS calculations, we only do them on small boxes. But as your volume increases, like all the way to a school bus, airplane, emergency room, um, a concert stage, you know, a Bravenal Hall and football stadium, clearly you're going to see that um, you cannot use the expensive models. And what we found is as follows, that the high resolution models they typically are focused to um, small simulation volumes. And for the average intermediate simulation volumes of travel events, you will see most focus is on RANs and, um, and scalars. There are some RANs and Lagrangian and some LES with scalars. Our study puts us over here. We had a larger, one of the largest simulation volumes ever done um, with an orchestra stage and we were with the LES with scalar. However, what we need, we need to be, oops, Sorry, my clicker is causing a lot of problems today. Okay. Let's see. Okay. What we really want is to bring in information from the high resolution models down to very cheap, um, to these very cheap models so that we have fast turn around times. And that's what we're working on right now. Um, some of the other outcomes, we had a couple of NIH proposals, actually three um, submitted um, on the subject. Um, two of them are still um, under review. One of them was declined. Um, we had a few interviews here and there, Was one with NPR, and it was like one of the um, um, best moments, very humbling to interview um, someone from NPR. Um, I hosted a mini symposium on CFD and COVID-19 and the AIAA conference. Um, I'm also hosting a uh, special issue, CFD and COVID-19 with the International Journal of Computational, Computational Fluid Dynamics. We're still soliciting authors. We had about um, six papers so far. Um, we published a manuscript in Science Advances. Um, um, that was, again, like one of the best moments of my life because I would never have ever dreamt that I would publish in a, in a, in a publication um, like that. It's probably the one-off time in uh, my entire life, but 
it was so so rewarding doing all of this all of the work um i want to thank all those who funded us you know salt lake county through the cares act the utah symphony and opera who uh, were involved with us throughout the entire process central fry performance computing who gave us all of these um cpu hours um we uh, applied the same analysis to capital theater i don't have the results here they're in the paper if you want to check it out um and again i thank my entire team and um uh, with that, I conclude the the talk. Let me step back a little bit so I get a little smaller, maybe, so you can see, um, you know, my contact info and uh, Professor Sutherland's contact info as well. And uh, with that, I will close the seminar. I'm going to step out and switch back to Zoom, and we can have a fun discussion over Zoom. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope this was as entertaining as it was hopefully um, um, useful and um, uh, with uh, and that you've learned something today thank you